Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Are you afraid of God? Do you fear God? For a Western New Testament Christian, this is always a bit of an odd question. We're not quite sure how to respond. Or if we do, think about it. We move on pretty quick. We want to move right to the grace. And that is good for the grace of God and Jesus is what brings us together. But we can't just forget about the fact that God is just and that he's rightly wrathful against sin. And today in our gospel reading, this is the question that one of the criminals on the cross asks the other criminal and the rulers who are mocking Jesus. These two criminals, one on either side of the chief criminal, Jesus Christ. Do you not fear God, he asks of the criminal that is joining in the chorus of mockery. But yet, from his words, we can tell that of all the people gathered there, he's the one who seems to be most fearful of all. His fear of God, as we will see, is part of what saves him. In a way, he's the only person who really knows what's actually happening to him and to Jesus. And that truth is going to set him free. And so we should be asking ourselves that question today. Do you not fear God? Well, the great scandal of our faith, of the Christian faith, is the cross of Jesus Christ. Because the cross of Jesus Christ is the most powerful place of the just wrath of God against sin. On full display, his righteous judgment of the world condemned for its sin. And God's wrath fully poured out, his wrath, his just wrath against the sinner. You see, God takes sin seriously. He really doesn't like it. It's a violation of the created order that he's made. It's a violation of our humanity. It's a violation of his Godhead. After all, that's what it means to be a just God. A just God can't just look the other way. He can't just say, oh, that's okay, because it's not. He doesn't abide sin nor does he abide those who commit it. They are an affront to him, an offense. In the scriptures, sometimes people who are committing sins are called abominations in the eyes of God. So I ask you again, do you not fear God? The criminal asks this question, And he asks it because they could not see the truth of what was happening on the cross. They could not see the truth of their own situation, nor could they see the truth of Jesus. But he was given the gift of faith, and through the eyes of faith he could see, not only truly see himself, but he could truly see Jesus. And what is that truth? The truth is, we should be afraid of God. He actually asks a longer question, I'll say it in full. Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And now as I was reading the the scriptures in preparation for my sermon today, that phrase, same sentence of condemnation, really jumped out at me. For he's referring to the same sentence of condemnation that he himself has, but what he probably doesn't realize is that is also referring to the fact that Jesus, the innocent Son of God, is also under the same sentence of condemnation. It points out 
how Jesus himself has placed himself voluntarily under the same sentence of condemnation reserved for those objects of the just wrath of God. Under the same sentence of condemnation of a sinner, of a criminal. They didn't just crucify anybody. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst sorts of people, the worst sorts of criminals. The criminal continues, And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. You see, he recognizes in this first gift of the faith that he's been given, he recognizes his own place. The reality of who he is has been made manifest to him. And so he's given the first gift of faith, that of repentance. Because now he can see the way things really are and who he really is, he can recognize that indeed as terrible as this this condemnation, this sentence that he is enduring is, he's actually right where he's supposed to be. He has no right to claim otherwise, as he says that, for we indeed justly are receiving the reward of our deeds. Well, dear friends in Christ, you have manifested this gift of faith today as well, for we too face the judgment of a just God on sinners. Ours sounded a bit different. We poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Have you ever wondered why we say that, or some form of that, at the beginning of every service? For we too, given the gift of faith and the eyes of faith, see the truth of our own situation. In divine service, we're coming into the presence of a just God. who doesn't abide sin or those who commit it. And so we too, like the criminal on the cross, make our confession, recognizing that we indeed are under a just sentence of condemnation. But the thief, the criminal, doesn't stop there. He continues and he says of Jesus, but this man has done nothing wrong. This man has done nothing wrong. Now, if we pair that sentence with the previous one regarding him being under the same sentence of condemnation, here we begin to see the first signs that the cross is not simply about the wrath of God against sin. Otherwise, Jesus' presence there makes no sense. That's not where he deserves to be. This sentence of condemnation would indeed be unjust applied to Jesus, who is innocent and perfect and has not done any of the things worthy of such a death. So it leads us to ask the question, why? What is he doing there? And not only that, but why does he remain there? He's the son of God. He doesn't have to stay there. He certainly has the ability to answer the calls of mockery. If you really are the Son of God, save yourself. Well, he certainly could do that. So the question remains for us and probably for this repentant thief. What's he doing here? Why is he here under the same sentence of condemnation? For indeed, he has done nothing wrong. And here is where we get to why the cross is the scandalous part of our Christian faith. It's not scandalous because God's just wrath is poured out against sin. That's, in fact, what we expect. And in our more honest moments, we, like the thief, when we come and confess our sins, acknowledge that he would be just in carrying out a sentence in that way. For we, indeed, justly are getting the due reward of our deeds. No, the cross is a scandal for an entirely different reason. 
It's a scandal because it's not only the place where the greatest image and actuality of the wrath of God poured out on the world is manifest, but it's also the place where the greatest act of mercy and love from God is made manifest in the very same place. And the key to understanding that is the answer to the question, what is Jesus doing there? And we get a clue as to what Jesus is doing there by the words he speaks in our gospel reading today. He only says a few things, but each one from the cross gives away the reason he's there. See, we begin to see this when Jesus addresses God on behalf of all of the people that are there mocking him. And he says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Think about that for a moment. The fully innocent Son of God on the cross has been crucified. He's being mocked by the very people He's come to love and to save. And still, even in such a situation, He pleads on their behalf to God the Father. (laughs) It's amazing. I can't even imagine the depth of love that would take. Can you imagine witnessing your child, an innocent, being killed by vile people? And even your own child calling out on their behalf. And you having all the power in the universe at your disposal, and yet you do nothing. But you let this plan of love and mercy and salvation continue. But his word of forgiveness doesn't stop there. His word of absolution continues. And we jump back to his conversation with the repentant criminal. Now the criminal turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Here's another gift of the faith that he's been given. A true confession. First he confessed of his own sin. And now a plea for mercy from Jesus. For he sees who Jesus really is. The Son of God. All authority in heaven and on earth is being given to him. He is the king of a kingdom that is not of this world. And when you're in trouble and you recognize it. And there's no way out. There's only one person you can go to. The one person who has the authority to change your fate. Who by their very words change the reality of the state of your life. In our earthly courts, that's the judge or the jury. And by their very words, you're either guilty or innocent. And so the criminal, knowing that Jesus is who he said he is, he maybe doesn't know all of what's going on. He maybe doesn't fully understand why Jesus is doing what he is doing. After all, who could? But he knows who Jesus is. And he knows that this is the one who I must make my plea for mercy. And so he does. So do we make this same plea Wherefore we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we all said together earlier, just a bit earlier, O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. It's the only option we have. We're in the same boat as the repentant criminal, suffering under the just condemnation of our deeds, with only one hope, the hope of a God, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, who placed himself under the same sentence of condemnation that we bear, despite having done nothing to deserve it. And in doing so, takes the full wrath of God against sin upon himself 
not leaving a drop for us. And then Jesus speaks gracious words of forgiveness and of hope and of life. Jesus says to this criminal, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The very work of mercy that brings about this absolution of the criminal sin and our own sin is completed that very day through the final judgment of sin upon the innocent Son of God. The innocent death of Jesus, the wrath and mercy of God on full display in the same place upon the same person, the innocent Son of God. Well, dear friends in Christ, today is the final Sunday of the church year. And as we end each church year every year, we always contemplate on the hope that is within us for the future. And that hope is the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in the meantime, we have to deal with the fallen world and our fallen selves and the forces of darkness arrayed against us. So how are we to wait? What are we to cling to, to endure in the midst of such a place? We cling to the cross. We cling to the cross because it reminds ourselves to guard our hearts. Now with the aid of the Holy Spirit from sin... For indeed, God takes sin seriously. His wrath against it is not just for show. Otherwise, Jesus would not have needed to go to the cross. And yet he does, bearing that wrath in our place. But we also cling to the cross because in it we rest secure. Secure in the hope and in the grace and in the mercy and the love that kept Jesus on the cross despite the unjust punishment he received in our place to bear the wrath of God so that we would not. We cling to the cross for his love and his sacrifice. There on that cross means that now we stand forgiven. So we join the criminal in our sorrow over sin, prompted by our faith in God to repent of those things, and in joyous relief and in faith accept the words of forgiveness spoken on his behalf, that not by what we've done, but by what he has done, that our robes have been washed clean and white in the blood of the Lamb. Your sins, they are forgiven. The answer to the question of who are you used to be, as the criminal realized, a justly judged criminal, a sinner, someone deserving of the wrath of God, but no more is that the answer. For Jesus, the one with the authority to do so, has spoken and has declared you righteous, forgiven children of God. And so you are. Dear fellow criminals, you have been made saints forgiven children of God through the innocent blood of Jesus. And so we cling to the cross awaiting His return, His glorious and victorious return, the feast of victory, the celebration of the marriage feast of the Lamb in His kingdom, which has no end. For now we are members of His family, children of God, and we will be with Him in paradise. In the name of Jesus.